Hello and welcome. So today I'm going to do a little bit of scene science and this is for the upcoming PRAC test that we have tomorrow which is based on testing manufacturers claims on the pH of products. Now I'm going to start off with a little bit of a you know a recap. As you know some things inside class in science such as validity, reliability and accuracy are constantly going to be referred to. So I'm going to start and explain some of that today. So um, this is directly out of the science handbook, which was uh, basically guidelines to what it should actually mean. So let's start off. So the validity of an experiment. The validity is the extent to which the processes and resultant data measure what was intended. So it's just basically saying if you want to know if an experiment's valid, it's that if the method actually tests what you wanted to test. So if you said, you know, hypothesis, um, I wanted to check that uh, the pH of a certain substance is 7, right? And I, in the hypothesis you wrote, um, uh, it will be 7 because it, like, you know, it, it looks like it's going to be pH 7. And suppose your method does something that's completely unrelated. There's a high chance that it is not a valid experiment. So that's what it basically refers to. It refers to the extent to which the processes and resultant data measure what was intended. Okay, moving on. Reliability. Now, reliability is also a big thing. Now, a lot of people say that they get mixed up with reliability and with accuracy, but that should never be the case, and I'll tell you just why. Reliability is the degree which, with which repeated observation and slash or measurements taken under identical circumstances will yield the same results. So, the key thing that you need to take out of reliability is repeat the test. Now, a lot of people also say that, oh yeah, we'll repeat it once or twice. The thing is that you should be repeating it several, if not more than nine times. So that's the magic number. Repeat more than nine times in order to ensure a reliable test. Now the reason why I'm saying nine times is because my biology teacher pretty much told us that anything less than nine doesn't show it's that reliable. So that's basically it. You need to repeat nine times. It's something you need to remember, really, that reliability is based off how many times you basically repeat the result and get the same results. So it's just showing that the results you have in the first place are reliable and they're not because of some other circumstance. Adding on, we've got accuracy. Now, accuracy, a lot of people also find difficult, but I'll tell you, it's simply not. You just need to get it out of your head. It's basically the exactness or precision of, me of a measurement relating to the degree of refinement in measurement or specification. So I'm going to uh, simplify this for you. So what it means is, you know, calibrating equipment, you know, um, and also, you know, just writing this out, and also, you know, um, making sure equipment is, you know, is um it's just uh is is to correct measurement like has the correct measurements so simply it's like um suppose you had a ruler which was supposed to be going in one centimeter intervals to thirty centimeters for accuracy your experiment wouldn't be that accurate if the one centimeter wasn't actually one centimeter. And suppose, you know, stuff like, um, basically anything, anything which isn't calibrated correctly and is giving you the wrong measurements makes the test inaccurate. So, uh, moving on, I'm just going to do a, a quick thing about, about this. What are some questions that you can ask yourself regarding reliability and validity? So, have I tested with repetition. So as I said, nine times to repeat. Now most tests, they if you, if you write repeat, you know, um, several times, they'll accept that. But for me, it's just kind of writing this would just make it a lot easier. Repeat nine times so the person actually knows what you're talking about. But um, you know, either way, whatever you actually write should be okay as long as you repeat it several times. Secondly, um, for so this is for the first-hand investigation data, and um, for the secondary information data, how consistent is the information with other information from reputable sources? Now, for the practice tomorrow, we don't need to worry about this, 
but for other people who are watching this video, this is basically um, regarding you know stuff that you get off the internet, of newspapers. Everything is just secondary information. So if you got information from Wikipedia, how can you tell it's accurate? Uh, how can you tell it's reliable? Well, you can't unless you test it with other things and see if it's actually reliable. Um, just gonna skip this because it's not really needed in our cause. But I'm gonna go down to validity. Does my procedure experiment actually test the hypothesis that I want to? Have all the variables been identified and controlled? So if you had a question, now I'm just going to give a quick example. Um, uh, let's just say question one. Was this experiment valid? Now what I would actually write, and this is just being me, I would write that um, yes, the experiment was valid. If the, if it was an experiment which was valid, um, the experiment is valid as all variables are controlled and identified. Further on, furthermore, my bad, furthermore, um, the hypothesis has been tested. So that's basically all I would write to say if I got the question, was this experiment, you know, valid? Okay, now I'm just going to move on and we'll go on to the next thing. Okay, so getting back to topic, this is basically what I think of um, when it's asking for the H8 outcome. So the H8 outcome basically says, relates the properties of chemicals to their uses. Now, I reckon that this is the dot point that they're looking for. So basically, this is my take on it. Identify and explain the use of common components of body soaps, cleaners, and shampoos, and the reason of their use. Now, this was in uh, topic area 2 of lifestyle chemistry. You should be able to find it in your notes or whatever you guys have. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through these and explain what I mean and how it's related to the prac we're going to do. Okay, so the common components of this uh, of most skin soaps, cleaners, and shampoos are surfactants, oils, fragrances, and dyes. So let's just think of it, it's obvious. So if you have skin soaps, cleansers, you obviously need them to get rid of dirt, oils, and um, they'll need to have surfactants, as well as fragrances and dyes to make it a, a bit more consumer friendly. Um, to add on, these, p the pH of these products should be compatible with those of the skin. Now, that's also something that should be obvious to you. Our skin needs to have a regulation of a good pH to support microflora. And this shows that if you're going to use any of these products, the pH should be pretty neutral towards the skin. It shouldn't do much to the pH in order to maintain a, you know, a regular pH of the skin. And the product should be compatible with, with the skin. So moving on, the surfactants are needed to assist water to attach to oil particles, including sebum that is produced by sweat glands. Now sebum is not only produced by sweat glands, it's also produced by, yeah, well it is, it's also produced in the head. So if we're going to talk about shampoo, sebum is also in the hair, basically. Um, the surfactant allows water to carry oil and dirt away from the skin surface. So if we also think about it, if the surfactant is carrying away oil and dirt, the oil is most likely going to be sebum, which is going to be, you know, pretty bad if it gets carried away. So, therefore, oils are included to replace the natural skin oil that is removed by the surfactant in the product. The oils can also protect skin surface or hair from dying. So as I said, since the surfactant is going to remove this sebum, this oil, and all the stuff in our hair, we need to use oils, and are included. they are included to replace natural skin oil, which is removed by the surfactant. So, of course, we're going to clean all the you know bad stuff from our hair out, but as we do that, we're going to lose quite a lot of oil from our hair as well, natural oil. And that oil is what keeps the hair healthy. In order for it to you know stay healthy, what we can do is that the oils are included to replace this natural skin oil that is removed by the surfactant. Going on, fragrances and dyes are used to make the product more attractive to use. As I said, consumer friendly, doesn't matter. 
um, because of these products, uh, because these products are for use on the skin, the pH of the products must be compatible with the skin, which lies in the range of four to six. So again, four to six is the you know the compatible region for the skin. Okay, so I'll be moving on to the next H outcome. Okay, so continuing, uh, I'm just going to mark off the H outcomes that we've completed. We've done this one, so we can just take it off, and we've done this one, so we can kick, to kick, tick that off, as well as we've assessed the validity of conclusions from gathered data and information. We'll do this later, but we've partially covered it anyway, so I'm just going to take it off for now. Um, let's move on to uh, this and this. So I am actually going to write up the PRAC report for you guys, and I hope it helps you. So let's go down through all the work we've just done before, and here's the PRAC report. So for me, the aim that I'm going to choose to have here is something like this. It's going to go something like this. It's to test the pH in the lab. and comparing it with the manufacturer's claim. Okay, so that's that's our aim and basically that's what we're going to be trying to do. We're going to be testing the pH of our product, which is most likely shampooed and we're going to compare it with the manufacturer's claim. So for this example, I've basically just said, you know, I'm going to use Dove shampoo and whatnot, but I'll include that in my equipment. Um, even in the PRAC report, if, if it's not even needed, you can just include it anyways if you, if you think you want to. So the hypothesis. In the hypothesis, I'm going to say something like this. The pH of shampoo... is um, found in the lab will be similar to the manufacturer's claim. Because let's face it, you know, um, most people, I mean, most companies which actually display the pH of their shampoo um, are pretty truthful. Okay, so we've done the hypothesis, we've done all this, um, now we can move on, as I said. So, we go on to the equipment. Now, so there's some stuff in equipment that you just need to know. So, sorry for my messy writing, it's just, I'm rushing and I've got a lot of stuff to do after this, so, here we go. The equipment that I'm going to use is something like 5 times measuring cylinders. Uh, then I'm going to use five test tubes. As you can see, I'm saying the exact amount that we actually need, and that's something you need to do in your equipment. So we're going to use five test tubes. We're going to use one test tube rack. We're also going to use the universal indicator. With chart. Um, adding on, we're going to use 40 ml of shampoo. As I said, I'm being pretty specific here as much as I can. And 60 ml of distilled water. Okay, now moving on. Uh, that that's our equipment, and just moving on. I love doing this before the actual method. Uh, it's just really simple, and in cases it can actually get you some extra marks. We have a risk assessment.
So in this risk risk assessment, you just need to include a table, and perhaps that table can just have you know hazards, as well as something like precautions that can be made. So I'm just going to uh, write that, and I'm just going to draw a line straight through the middle. Okay, here we go. So let's think about it. What hazards can actually happen in this practice? Well, shampoo can get into your eyes. Now, that's obviously bad. So what can we combat this with? Now, <laughs> as much as I say it, something that's pretty funny is that if you just want a simple thing to use in your risk assessment and it's super easy, the cop-out technique that most people just can just instantly relate to is just, you know, goggles for your eyes. So in many cases in an experiment, we're going to need to use goggles anyway to, you know, protect our eyes. And eyes are pretty, you know, uh, delicate parts of our body. So let's move on. Um, we know one of them. Let's just add a couple more. So just another line through. I'm going to say universal indicator. Can be dangerous if in contact with skin. And to combat this, I'm going to say wear protective gloves. And lastly, I'll just do one last one. Shampoo is acidic. It's usually acidic. So, stuff about that is like you should really avoid um, swallowing as it could be poisonous. and dangerous. Once again, I'm really sorry for the layout of how I've actually done this, and I haven't used enough pretty colors, but that's pretty much because I don't have enough time. So um, let's just uh, have a quick review. So our aim was to test the pH of the lab and comparing it uh, to pH of shampoo. Sorry about this in the lab and comparing it with the manufacturer's claim. The pH of shampoo was found in the lab will be similar to the manufacturer's claim. Okay, that was our hypothesis. We moved on and we said that we're going to use five measuring cylinders, one, five test tubes, one test tube rack, universal indicator with chart, 40 ml of shampoo. Now, on the day, they'll probably tell you what shampoo it is, so I'll just say, you know, Dove shampoo for now. Uh, 60 ml of distilled water. And Here's my now I'm not actually going to go onto the method and the rest of the report. Um, main reason being because the test is actually tomorrow and it would be pretty stupid of me of uh, exposing my method anyways. You guys can do it yourself. I'm sure you're very competent and you'll have no problems doing it. Miss has explained it. We've done it a few times in class, so there should be no problem in it. So I'm just going to mark it off. So, um, yep, that's fine. You guys will figure that out. It's, it'll be okay. And use the terminology and reporting styles appropriately to successfully to and successfully to communicate information and understanding. Yeah, that's fine. You know the method, the discussion, the conclusion, all that. Now that leaves us with all of this done. That we've covered quite a few H points, um, and uh, obviously you have too, because you're going to be doing a couple of these, these two. And the last one that leaves us is justifies the positive values and attitudes towards both living and non-living components of the environment, ethical behavior, and a desire for critical evaluation of consequences of applications. Now, the best way I can put this is, I'm not, I'm not even going to really go into depth, but um, just off the top of my head, since it says justify, you need to make a conclusion. I'm sorry, I'm going to undo that. You need to make a conclusion, right? And you need to make a, your own opinion on it. 
And since it's on, you know, positive values about attitudes towards both living and non-living components of the environment, ethical behavior, and a desire for a, a critical evaluation for the consequences of applications of science. In my opinion, what this means is pH. Now, the main prac is based on pH, so I don't think they'll ask us a question on this, which is not based on pH. So it's just something about, it's just something for you to think about, you know. Um, what, 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 what can pH do, which is... Um, not so great to the environment and ethical behavior, and it's a reason of the applications of science. So I'm I'm not even going to go and talk about this because I'm I'm sure you're more than competent of learning this yourself, and I'm sure you already know it. So the, since this was a pretty long, you know, um, video, I hope this has helped you, and I hope that you do the best you possibly can tomorrow. Thank you. Hey, just saying, it's taken me around two hours to produce this. It has 20 minutes worth of content regarding the test tomorrow. And I really didn't have to do this. I just did it out of goodwill to help others. So I really do hope it helped. And just any feedback would be great. Thanks.